Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of How to Live to 200. I'm T.A. McCann, serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and advocate for the quantified self. Today, I'm joined by Gil Blander. Gil is a PhD in biology, an entrepreneur, and a health technology executive. His entire career has been dedicated to the science of aging. And today, we're going to talk to him about how you can improve your health by analyzing your blood. In 2013, Gil founded a company called Inside Tracker. It's a blood testing startup, but don't think it's another Theranos. The company analyzes the blood for its clients with a singular goal of helping them improve their health. By looking at the levels of five different key biological markers, such as glucose, testosterone, and others, Inside Tracker is able to provide insight and suggestions and even tell you how old you are on a biological basis. Today, many people that use Inside Tracker are professional athletes. Gil has a great story about Mark Melanson, a relief pitcher for the San Francisco Giants that made dramatic improvements in his blood chemistry. But the technology is available to anyone that wants to optimize their health. Gil is a knowledgeable guy, and he has lots of insights on vitamins and diet. Aging is something that's clearly passionate about, and I think that comes through during our conversation. If you're at all interested in the science of optimal health, I think you'll enjoy it. And now, this is How to Live to 200. So, uh, Gil, welcome to the show. Maybe while we get going, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so my background is I was born and raised in Israel, a PhD in biology from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Then in 2002, I moved to MIT and done a postdoctoral fellowship at the lab of uh, Lenny Garanta, which is a leader in aging research. I spent five years there, and then uh, I moved to the industry and worked in a couple of uh, system biology and technology companies. And the idea is to try to find an idea that will help me to start my own company. And the goal was to start a company that related to health, wellness, and longevity. I came with the idea in 2009. Basically, the idea was uh, the beginning of InstaTracker. What we are doing at at InstaTracker, we are trying to help people to live longer, healthier life based on what's happening inside their body. To understand what's happening inside the, their body, we are using mainly blood biomarkers that showing to us what happened in the body. And based on that, we are giving them recommendation what food to eat, what supplement to take, what exercise to do, and what lifestyle changes to make in order to live longer, better life. Let's go back just a little bit. And in your education, when you're going through your PhD, like why and when did you get involved or interested in, in longevity or was it some other category to start off? Yeah, yeah, it was definitely longevity, but it was actually much earlier than that. Uh, At the age of 12, a relative of mine passed away from uh, cancer. And instead of being sad about her uh, leaving the world, I was really sad about myself because I realized that I won't live forever. Uh, So at that point, I decided that I want to understand why do we age and try to find a way for us to live longer. And from that moment on, I uh, decided to dedicate my life to for the longevity field. And inside inner, inside Tracker, you have a feature called Inner Age. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so because I'm uh, really intrigued by the aging process and because we have a, a great scientific advisory board, including Lenny Garanta and David Sinclair, which are part of the five leader scientists in the world that studying aging, we decided to try to find or establish a feature that will allow people to understand how old they are from the inside and non, not only based on their uh, driving license. So we spent a couple of years, myself, David, and Lenny, and another scientist from MIT, and we tried to understand which of uh, the blood biomarkers that we are using at, uh, at Inside Tracker are relevant for uh, aging or longevity, and uh, which of them can direct us to understand what is the age of a, a specific user based on those biomarkers. So as I said, we spent a couple of uh, years on that, and we pinpoint the list to around five blood biomarkers that are really relevant to try to understand what is your biological age. And those biomarkers are glucose, marker of uh, liver health, marker of inflammation, vitamin D, and testosterone that can uh, pretty nicely show us what, uh, what is your age based on your uh, biomarkers. 
So you mentioned the term biomarkers. For people who are not familiar with that, maybe you could just talk about what that means. Yeah, biomarker is uh, someone that marks a specific issue. And bio, it means that it's marked a specific issue in our body. So biomarker can be blood biomarker, which uh, we will discuss and discuss before. It can be a genetic marker that shows that you have a risk for something. And it can be a physiological marker that marks something physiologically that you have. For example, your heart rate or your weight or uh, your activity or your sleep. All of those are more like a physiological markers. When you look at people who have a big difference between their chronological age and their inner age, what do you feel like are the biggest differences, the biggest trends? Are they all across those five buyer markers, or are there ones that really stand out as something that someone should control? Yeah, so all those biomarkers are important for inner age, but by far the one that is most important in our opinion, and I think that it's not in our opinion, is basically the level of blood glucose that you have in your body. And uh, I see it as the, uh, the gorilla in the room. And I think that if uh, you will ask me which is the blood biomarker that you should uh, uh, pay most attention to, it will definitely be the blood glucose. Let's talk about that in a little bit more depth. So if I want to pay attention to my blood glucose, what should be the things I should do in my lifestyle or my diet to improve that or really keep it in check? Yeah, so blood glucose is influenced by several different uh, criteria. Nutrition is definitely a very important one. Also, the lifestyle is very important because if you are not sleeping enough or you are too stressful, uh, the level of blood glucose can increase. Also, athletic activity or a physical activity can change that, uh, and definitely supplementation. So it's a, it's a marker that you can uh, influence it in a, a lot of different ways, which is uh, really great because we have a lot of good tools to maintain our blood glucose in the right level, but unfortunately, most of us are not paying attention to that. So I was pretty happy. I've been an Inside Tracker user since 2015, I think. So I'm, I'm excited because my inner age comes in at 34, and I'm 50, chronologically, I'm 52 at this point. And I'm wondering if I keep all of these markers in check, can I stay 34? No, you can't, because what we've done with the inner age is that uh, someone that is now 80, it doesn't make sense for him to stay 34. So basically, we, we define the, the size of the code for each person, and uh, someone in your age that is uh, in his 50s can, can be in his 30s if his inner age is uh, great, but you cannot be 18 or 20. So basically, we define the, uh, the size of the code based on the level or the effect of uh, each biomarker based on the level of the biomarker uh, for you, and then we combine it to a score that doesn't allow you to be 34 forever, but you will start getting older even if your uh, blood biomarker will be completely optimized. Okay, I think that's an inside pro-pro feature, is if you can help me stay 34 forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will do my best. <laughs> Tell me about, in this inner age category, what have been the sort of the biggest differentials you've seen between chronological age and inner age? And what did those people look like? What did you test? What did you find in those kind of people? So first insight is that we see that when a user starting to test with inner age, around 70% of them are older than the chronological age. So most of our population is older in their inner age than chronological age. But we see that then when they're testing a second time or third time, we can start seeing uh, improvement in their inner age and they, some of them even becoming younger than the chronological age. I think that the inner age is a, a very good feature because uh, basically it's a one number that allows you to compare your chronological age to your inner age and then uh, basically to understand a, a lot of different biomarkers around it coming and uh, summarizing one number, which is very good and easy for everyone, from uh, someone like David Sinclair to a very simple person, to understand what does it mean and then uh, uh, to intervene to try to improve it. I, I think that that's a great feature because of the simplicity of the feature. I'm interested not comparing to the worst, but comparing to the best. So tell me about somebody who has like this chronological age and yet has a dramatically different inner age. What did they, what did they do and how big is that difference? That's what I want to learn from. You can be as younger as uh, uh, around 20 something years younger than your chronological age and be older uh, 20 or so years of your uh, chronological age as well. 
again, it's depend on your age and it's uh, depend a bit about your gender and uh, a few other criteria. But uh, roughly the size of the coat is usually around 20 or so years below or above your chronological age. I'm enjoying the fact that, that when I look at my report, like my little uh, hash on the mark is, is right around optimal. So I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, and you, you should be proud because, as I said, most of our users are older than their uh, chronological age. Yeah. So as you think about the sort of the state of the art today, which you guys are certainly living at, project us a little bit into the future, sort of three to five years in the future. What is this category of science is going to tell us? What are you most excited about in that, the sort of the near term future? Yeah. So I can tell you what we are working on and what we are trying to head. So I think that we started and I think that we are doing a pretty good job with blood biomarkers. But recently, we also added a, another input that called a genetic markers that help us to understand better uh, the potential of that person. We are currently working on uh, adding also physiological markers, and we are starting to think about a microbiome. So I think that uh, having all of those different input will allow us to understand the specific person much better than just looking at the blood biomarkers. We think that blood biomarkers validate and calibrate all the other inputs, but still there is value for other inputs. So we are very excited about that. We think that we also want to improve the the output in the sense of uh, not uh, only looking at a few biomarkers together, but look at all of them together and look at the changes over time and give you recommendation that look at, at you completely holistically and not the way that we are doing right now, which is great but we can make it even better. And I think that a, a very important uh, addition that we we are working on is allow you to easily upload your result uh, from your physician or the, your genetic result from 23andMe and basically allow you to bring your own result and use it and uh, use our uh, algorithmic uh, platform to give you a much better uh, recommendations. So we are spending uh, some time and some uh, investment on that because we know that almost everyone in the world have data of blood, but most of us are storing it in a drawer in, inside a manila folder, and we are not getting any value from that. So seeing that a- allowing you to do that will be a great achievement. And as you're wandering the halls at MIT or other sort of scientific areas, and if you think about this sort of near-term future, like what are the areas, who are the researchers that are sort of on the cutting edge in this category? So if we are looking, uh, talking about the diagnostic field, I think that there are a lot of progress in uh, uh, making the diagnostic much less invasive. And I'm sure that all of you heard about Theranos and the promise and the fall of Theranos, which is very sad. But there are uh, actually uh, several companies that are doing that. They are doing it quietly and uh, less uh, glitzy. But uh, there are some uh, platforms like uh, Abut Eistat which is a, a platform, it's a desktop platform that you can basically prick your finger, a few drops of blood uh, into a machine, and then two minutes later you can receive data of uh, 12 analytes that uh, it's in the quality of a real lab like Western Lab Corp that can allow you to understand what's happening, send the data to us or other platform and give you recommendations. So that's something that uh, actually available today. The problem is, is that you need to use it under the umbrella of a, a physician. So it's not available to you and me to do it at home. But I think that a platform like that, when they will be available, will allow us to get the data and the recommendation very soon and very easily without a, a waiting and without the hassle of going to the lab. There are other platforms like a company like Seven Sense that uh, basically allow you to extract the blood easily from a instead of uh, using the normal uh, phlebotomy uh, blood test by a machine that uh, stuck to your arm and uh, suck the blood uh, using thousands of uh, very small capillary uh, that extract the blood almost uh, painless. So there are a platform like that. And I think that then when you have the data, all the uh, machine learning and the algorithm and the expert system that we are in other are building will allow you to receive much better and more a uh, specific recommendation, which can be exciting for all of us. When you think about that, those types of systems at home, and you think about a normal user, or let's say somebody who's really interested in either performance or on longevity, 
What do you think they're going to be doing in terms of frequency of testing and uploading data? How often will they do it? What will they be fine? Yeah, I think that it depends on, on the user. Just, as you said, if uh, you are a marathon runner or a triathlete or LeBron James, you might do it every morning to know exactly what should you do. For other uh, population, I think that it can be done uh, less frequently. And it also depends on the issue that you have. So if I'm looking at your uh, uh, blood results and you have issue with glucose and uh, with uh, cholesterol, it doesn't make sense to test it every day because it takes time to, to get into the steady state. But if uh, I'm looking at a level of uh, muscle damage such as uh, creatine kinase or you want to know whether you are stressful today or not, looking at uh, a cortisol, it might be makes sense for you to test every day. So it depends on uh, uh, what is your goal and also depends on what are the issues that you have in your blood. When we were speaking before, you related a story about a professional athlete. Could you give us a little bit more detail about that and what, what you found, what he changed, and what were the results? Yeah, yeah, sure. The name of the athlete is uh, Mark Melanson. He's currently a pitcher uh, and uh, supposed to be the closer at the Giants in San Francisco. And actually, I met Mark in 2011 or 12 when he was still uh, playing at the Red Sox. And at that time, his uh, ERA was uh, around six. But when I met with him, I was uh, very excited about the person because he's a, a very dedicated, someone that likes to do the best in order to succeed. So he's a very unique athlete in the way that uh, he's uh, nice and they uh, want to learn and they're uh, trying to to do the best in order to improve himself. So he's a very hard worker person. We, uh, we started to uh, test him within the tracker. And then uh, uh, at the same year, he moved to the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the year after that, his ERA dropped down to around 1.4. And basically, he had a, a great uh, a season. He pitched uh, around 71 innings. Uh, he done a very good job, and he also was selected to be at the All-Star Game at, at that season. Again, I, w- I wouldn't say that all of that came by Insta Tracker, but uh, Mark was interviewed a few times uh, uh, in the public uh, journals, and he, uh, he mentioned that uh, he, he see Insta Tracker as a very important part that helped him to improve his performance as a MLB player. So. Uh, That's a very exciting uh, example. In that case, was there something that Mark found that he changed from a diet, nutrition, supplementation perspective that really, you know, made an impact on his athletic performance, do you think? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, uh, so he made uh, uh, several changes. Again, I I don't want to get into that because it's his own uh, data. But I can say that uh, everyone that uh, using Insta Tracker, and uh, I'm sure uh, TA that you have seen that, nobody is perfect, and everyone have an issue, and uh, we are like a machine, so we can always uh, improve the machine. And but we need a guidance and understand whether a specific food is good for me or not, whether I have an issue with metabolism or I have an issue in, with inflammation or with stress. And then when you know that and you have the tool, we are telling you exactly what food to take, what supplement to uh, supplement, or what supplement to stop supplementing, that's, that's a great guidance because then you know exactly what is the problem and you know exactly what is the solution. One of the things I love about your product is that you go from both a test, in, a test to a quantified result and you have this feature called Food Basket, which tells me, like, based on these issues, I need to change these things in my diet in order to improve those particular markers. I really love that feature. One thing that's super frustrating is that you don't deliver me the food to my door. So when in the future are we going to have an inside tracker or someone else delivering me exactly what I should eat when in a prepared meal with the right amount of everything? How far is that in the future? Yeah, uh, it's it's a very good uh, question. And you're basically asking me, uh, how can we close the loop and make it a one-stop shop in a way? Uh, that give you the inside the recommendation and then giving you the uh, the material to follow the recommendations. Uh, and we are uh, thinking about it a lot, and we are also uh, uh, talking with uh, some uh, uh, big partners that we would like to do it together with them, uh, because we we see inside tracker as the nerd behind. We are uh, basically the scientists and the technologists that. Uh, 
uh, building the platform, but we don't see ourselves as a marketers and a sales company. So we are uh, working now with uh, partners to close the loop uh, via a few different avenues. And hopefully very soon uh, uh, it will be available. Hashtag Amazon Fresh, hashtag Blue Apron. I hope you're listening. Please bring that to my door. <laughs> Earlier you were talking about glucose as a particularly large influence in inner age. And I'm looking at my own results now. My blood glucose last time I tested it was 78. It looks like it's lived around 78, between 78 and 86 for a while. Looks like the right range, as referenced in my report, is 65 to 99. Like, what is the, what's the lowest I could get? Is there good to get it lower than 65? I always like to exceed a little bit, like whatever the limit is there. I want to get a little bit better than that. So what, what would you recommend that I get that number to? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the lowest that you should strive for is not less than 65, because below 65, you won't have enough uh, energy in the body. Actually, glucose is uh, the energetic uh, currency in the body, and it's, uh, it's the energy that uh, allows your muscle to move, allow your brain to, to shrink. So it's very important that it won't be too low. The question about the high is, if you look at all the uh, diagnostic lab, the level of glucose is, the normal range is between 65 to 99, and it doesn't matter if you are a male or female, old, young, athletic, active, or couch potato, all of us have the same normal range of 65 to 99. So what we done in InstaTracker, we came and say, let's try to understand what is the optimal zone. Because uh, being normal is uh, boring. We want to be optimal. And everyone now, we are the most important machine that we have. Let's try to optimize it. So we spent a lot of time looking at the scientific literature. And we found a lot of data. Part of it come from the Freningham Heart Study. It's actually a study that was done in a small town here in uh, Massachusetts next to Boston called Freningham. And they followed the population for uh, around 50 years and looked at uh, a lot of different uh, uh, blood biomarkers. And uh, one of the studies that came from this uh, study uh, showed that uh, there is a correlation between the level of your blood glucose in, uh, in young age to longevity that, uh, or the length of time that you live in an uh, older age. So basically, if your uh, glucose will be at specific unit at a specific age, that can reflect, maybe, I'll give you as, as some hint, whether you live to 90s, to 80s, or to 70s. So we use such a data, basically, to come and tell us what is the level of uh, glucose that uh, a specific person at a specific uh, age with a specific gender should strive for in order to live the longer that he can. I'm also looking at my report, and the only red value I have is vitamin D. Now, we live in Seattle. But I'm really interested in, do you see vitamin D? I hate having a red on my own report. I need to get that fixed up. So do you see lots of people with vitamin D deficiency? What do people do with vitamin D deficiency? How important is it to get that fixed? Yeah, vitamin D deficiency is a big problem. We have around 50% of our population that their level is uh, too low. And the issue is that our society worked most of the time under the fluorescent light and uh, under the sun. So we are not receiving enough uh, sun. And because of that, we, are, we don't receive enough, uh, uh, we, are, we don't build enough vitamin D. In addition to that, it's very hard to get it from food. So there are only a few kinds of food that uh, uh, are enriched in vitamin D. Some of them are uh, fatty fish. Some of them are unique kind of uh, mushrooms. And there are a few foods that are fortified with vitamin D. But usually that's not enough. So the best solution for vitamin D is actually to supplement with vitamin D3 supplementation. Tell us more about that. What do you see as the best vitamin D supplementation? So we, we are trying not to recommend a specific brand. So I won't go into a brand. But uh, what I can say that uh, if you ask your uh, primary care physician, they will come and tell you, hey, 400 are you of vitamin D? Uh, is what you should take. And if you have a very low one, they might say 1,000 are you of vitamin D. What we have seen in our data and in the study that we've done on our data is that uh, anything below 2,000 are you of vitamin D won't move the needle. And in some cases, you even need to use 5,000 
international unit of vitamin D a day in order to increase your vitamin D level. So basically our algorithm will re- recommend to you the right amount based on the level that you have. So 5,000 or more a day. No, no, I'm saying 2,000 to 5,000. Above 5,000, it doesn't make sense to take because uh, you cannot absorb it. So uh, we never recommend more than 5,000. So you mentioned algorithms a couple times and maybe in passing machine learning. With the data that you now have at Inside Tracker, tell us more about what you think that future is going to look like when you can really apply proper machine learning to this category of data. Yeah, so we are actually in the process. We submitted a, a peer review scientific publication on our data. And what we done first, we wanted to, as a scientist, I wanted to see whether uh, our uh, recommendation help people uh, uh, indeed to improve and optimize those biomarkers. So we looked at, uh, uh, at uh, our population and we have seen that in our cohort, we can uh, significantly improve markers related to metabolism, related to inflammation. Uh, related to stress, related to a lot of different endpoints. And as I said, we submitted it for publication. But in addition to that, we also started to build a network and to try to understand if vitamin D is improving from a baseline to follow-up. What other biomarkers are changing together with vitamin D? And do the same for uh, LDL and do the same for glucose. And then try to start building a network and understand, uh, just by looking at the data without any uh, prior uh, data, to understand what are the network. How can you build a network of markers that if vitamin D is changing, what are the other markers that will change because vitamin D is changing or in parallel to vitamin D? A neural net type of approach. Yeah, it's a more like a data science approach. And we, we have seen a lot of interesting uh, discovery that we found there. And actually, that what we are a feeling that we are doing right now is not only extracting data from a peer-reviewed scientific publication, but also we are starting to create science. So that's a very, very exciting. We also we can also look at our data and come and say, what is the effect of someone uh, that uh, eating a lunch every day outside versus someone that bring the lunch with him uh, to the office? And we've seen that in a lot of the metabolic-related markers, if you will uh, stop buying a uh, lunch and bring your own lunch, you might your uh, glucose might be might be much better, and your LDL might be much better, and your inflammation might be much better just by making a small change. So again, we are creating science based on our uh, data. Uh, we we are doing that in a, a lot of different approaches. For example, last month, one of the best coaches in the uh, CrossFit, his name is uh, Ben Barjan. Uh, publish an article in the CrossFit Journal that use our data, and basically using our data, it defines who is a CrossFitter, what is the level of a, a triglyceride of CrossFitter comparing to the average population, what is the level of other markers, and basically use uh, the biomarkers to define how CrossFitter looks like, what are the better than the other, and w- where they are uh, having issues, and so on and so forth. So it's a very... Very interesting uh, article. Again, it's not a peer review publication, but it's a very interesting article that uses our data on uh, uh, more than a thousand crossfitters and try to define how crossfitter looks from the inside. Was there something that really stood out as unique as crossfitters? Yeah, so definitely they look uh, healthier than others. We have seen that they are uh, triglycerides. On average, it's much lower than uh, the average population. So uh, it's definitely it was very interesting to uh, to look at the population and compare it to the total co- uh, to the whole comp- uh, population and see how are they different than the uh, general population. What do you notice about people's diets? So I've been a I've been a pescatarian for twenty seven years ish and vegan sometimes, vegetarian some other times. What do you What have you seen in your broad population? What do you recommend in terms of that? category of diet? Yeah, so there are a lot of fashion in diet, let's say. And today, the uh, paleo diet, ketogenic diet are uh, really in uh, fashion. And in my opinion, it's not, a, or in our opinion, it's not one uh, a solution fit all. So uh, the ketogenic diet or the paleo diet might be good for a specific population, but it mod- won't be good for a different kind of population. 
So what we are trying to do is to feed the diet for you based on what's happening inside your body and then give you the best scientific solution to do that. Some of the diets, as I said before, it might be good for me, but might not be good for you, TA. And it's very hard to know without looking inside. What's your perspective on this whole category of fasting and intermittent fasting, which is a big up-and-coming trend? Yeah, um, so again, uh, that's uh, actually my passion because uh, caloric restriction, I'm sure that you heard about it, TA, is, uh, uh, is a big, big uh, field in the uh, aging research. And actually... Uh, I think that it was in the 1930s, uh, a scientist uh, 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 done an experiment on rats and basically restricted the amount of food that they got by uh, about 50%, and those rats live uh, around 50% longer. Then, uh, uh, since then, uh, there were a lot of studies on uh, mice and yeast and worms and uh, fish and even monkeys that showed that uh, indeed caloric restriction uh, can increase the lifespan of uh, all of those mo- uh, model organisms, but it's not only increased the lifespan, it's, it also increased the quality of life. So they have less cancer, they have less uh, cardiovascular diseases. Recently, there have been a few studies on humans, and also those studies showed, again, it's very hard to show in humans that you live longer because you need to do a very long experiment. But they showed that marker of uh, longevity, such as uh, blood pressure, a, a glucose level, heart rate, were uh, going in the right direction. So there, there is a lot of data in the scientific literature from uh, East till human that's showing that uh, uh, those interventions are good. Actually, I'm doing, I'm following a, a time restriction a, a diet that basically I'm trying to starve myself from 7 p.m. to 11 a.m. every day. And I feel great. And I think if you think about it in the way of evolution, we are not supposed to be next to refrigerator and uh, at 1 a.m. when we wake up at night to drink milk. It doesn't make sense. We, we used to hunt and gather, and uh, we had a few days that we haven't had any food, and we survived. And the uh, average person can survive a few, maybe 10 or 20 days without eating anything. So I think that uh, uh, the caloric restriction is a, is a good intervention. There is a lot of data in the scientific literature but still, the NIH and other organizations are doing studies about that. So I wouldn't recommend anyone to do that without consulting with his uh, physician. But definitely, there is a lot of potential in the caloric restriction or time restriction uh, uh, diet. Do you do that 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. restriction every day? No, I'm doing 7 uh, uh, p.m. to 11 a.m. Every yeah. day? Uh, I'm doing it most of the day, sometimes over the weekend uh, when I have a party or uh, if I need to exercise heavily in the morning, I won't, I will stop it earlier. So you need to in- include the common sense. If you are going to run a marathon, <laughs> you should eat before the marathon or during the marathon. But if you are an average Joe that uh, driving to work and uh, staying at work, you can you can survive without eating uh, breakfast. It okay. kind of goes kind of goes against breakfast is the most important part of the day. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. And uh, actually, I I've seen that first with uh, David Sinclair. One day I met with him, and it was 11 a.m. and we had like a small talk. And I asked him, "What have you had for breakfast?" I said, no, no, I, I I'm not eating until noon time. And I said, "Oh, he's he's crazy." And then I got into that and I started to do it as well. And when you get into that, it's not hard. It's actually, you are not hungry. It's like, that's your routine. Yeah, in my case, I would say that I only eat breakfast maybe one day a week. Uh, I rarely eat before noon and oftentimes I don't eat until 12. So I'll, I'll have my dinner and then I don't eat until midday the next day. And I've been testing sort of 24 hour fasts, 36 hour fasts. Partially because I'm busy and partially because I'm just interested in it. And so I found that same type of thing. Maybe that's why my inner age is so low. It's definitely one of the reasons. And what is nice about a caloric restriction or time restriction, a restricted diet, is that you don't need to get stick to that uh, uh, completely. So even if one, one day a week or two days a week, you, you change your routine, that's okay. You still uh, most likely ha- will have the benefit of that. So it's, it's great because you don't have to stick to that 100%. So you mentioned your own experience with fasting. Can you tell us like what 
changed as you started this fasting? What you measured in your own inside tracker results? So I, I, I've seen that uh, uh, my glucose, and again, glucose is a, a very important marker, went to the right direction. Again, I'm not as uh, optimized as you, TA, so I'm still struggling with that, but uh, I definitely could see a, an improvement in my uh, glucose. Uh, but I'm not only doing a, a intermittent fasting. I'm also a, have incorporated a, a few other interventions. We mentioned before the vitamin D level, so... I uh, used to have a, a, a very low level of vitamin D. And when I started, I said, okay, we need uh, using food. So I basically ate fish for breakfast, lunch, and, lunch and dinner for a, a couple of months. And then I tested again, and I haven't seen any change. So I realized that, uh, at least for me, fish is not the solution. And uh, since then, I'm supplementing with vitamin D supplementation. I'm actually using 5,000 IU every other day. And my uh, vitamin D got into the optimal zone. I also realized that my B12 was low, and I was trying to work on nutrition with that, and that didn't help me a lot. So I uh, uh, supplementing with vitamin B12. Another supplement that I'm using is garlic, that uh, help you can help both your glucose and your uh, cholesterol. And I added a lot of food that uh, are high in uh, fiber because fiber is uh, very good for metabolism, be, uh, both cholesterol and glucose. So I'm eating oatmeal every day. I try to eat a lot of berries to help with the fiber. I'm uh, consuming, I'm trying to consume more beans, even that I don't like beans and it's not tasty for me. I see it as a fuel, so I am trying to eat as much bean as I can. So those are the interventions that I'm using currently. We've talked a lot about, at least in our group, about supplements. What supplements you should take, how many, how often. If, what have you seen on the extreme side, and at what point do you get like too many supplements? Yeah, th- I think that that's a great question. And if I recall correctly, we uh, quantified it a few months ago, and we've seen that uh, around 30% of our population have at least one marker that is in the red high, because they are supplementing. Uh, a good example is vitamin B12. Uh, vitamin B12, a lot of people are uh, supplementing with that and they don't need. And then they get to, uh, into the red zone, the high red zone. We've seen it with folic acid. You can see it with iron. So we, we live in a population that some people are just in order to cover themselves, they are over uh, protecting themselves and that can be harmful. So we, we definitely see that. It's also the multivitamin that uh, a lot of us are consuming and the energy drink that have a lot of uh, vitamin B12 and other uh, ingredient. So we definitely have an issue in our society with over-supplementation. If money were no object for you, what kind of things would you be trying right now in terms of testing or supplements or additives to your lifestyle, what would you be trying if money were no object? Yeah, I I think that uh, luckily for me, I'm uh, doing that as uh, my profession. So I think that uh, I'm doing the, uh, maybe the, uh, not the best that I can do, but basically uh, trying to do as close to the best that I can do. So uh, testing myself uh, uh, with uh, blood, with genetics, with activity tracker, trying to compile the data together and get the most and the best uh, scientific recommendations. So that's what I will do, and I will be very careful not to follow something that was written it at uh, men's magazines or uh, women magazines or L magazine, because those are very dangerous, like uh, follow a, a specific diet that is now in fashion, but it might not be good for you. So I will be very careful w- uh, with that. That's what I will do. So we've gone through all different kinds of uh, suggestions and topics, but if you had to make it simple, what would be the three things you would recommend people do to improve their longevity? Yeah, so I think that first we we love the extreme. We either not exercise at all or we exercise a lot, and we need to take it into moderation. So that's one thing that uh, I will recommend. We definitely today, we don't sleep enough. And we can see it in your blood. As a a human being, uh, you need to try to sleep as much as you can. 
And uh, even if uh, you will miss the 5.30 a.m. Uh, class, it's uh, much better to sleep another half an hour and uh, try to exercise later than to go to the 5.30 a.m. class. We eat a lot of junk food and we eat uh, a lot in restaurants and we tend not to cook at home because we are lazy. And uh, because of that, we compromise the quality of the fuel that we are giving to our body. We are very stressful because we are a lot, uh, spending a lot of time on the computer, iPhone, iPad, TV, Netflix. And again, we can see it in our blood. So basically, if we'll follow those uh, four avenues, we can uh, make our life much better. So cook more, sleep more, and carry my lunch to work. Yeah. Great. If people want to learn more about this topic, what do you think they should be reading? Yeah, so I think that if uh, they are interested in uh, aging, I think that they uh, should uh, try to follow a person like David Sinclair and, uh, and Lenny Garanta. That, uh, I know that David Sinclair is pretty active in, uh, in Twitter, so they can uh, follow him. There is an organization that's called Aging 2.0 that uh, basically looking and working on the uh, on activities related to aging and longevity. So I think that that's something that will be interesting uh, for the audience. Uh, there are a, a few conferences that are partially scientific, but I think that uh, people that are interested in aging uh, might be good for them to follow. So there is a Cold Spring Arbor Aging Meeting that occur every other year. I think that is happening this year. And there is a Paul Glenn uh, Symposium on Aging, uh, actually this June here in Boston. But there are a lot of uh, different aging-related uh, conferences all over the world. So if you are interested in that and you want to go deep into the science, uh, you have a lot of opportunity all over the world to learn more. And where can people learn more about you or Inside Tracker? That's pretty easy. They can go to InsideTracker.com and find a lot of information there. Thanks a lot for being on the show today, Gil. Thank you so much, T.A. You've been listening to another episode of How to Live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L200 crew that includes Lauren Krajinski, Sam Matera, Troy Strandquist, and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com, or find us on Twitter or Instagram at howtolivetoto 200 where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well.